Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii, where each week we explore more things to like about science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, and today we're going to discuss an amazing, ambitious, and admirable project, Club H2O, that distributes an innovative water filter to places around the world that lack access to clean water. We're honored to have with us today uh, the, one of the board members of Club H2O, Mr. Terry Lamb. Welcome, Terry. Good to have you on the show. Uh, thank you for having me here. Very nice it's to have you. You're able to get it here. So let me just jump right on in. And uh, Terry, you're, a, you're an undergraduate uh, uh, systems I'm major. Industrial, I'm industrial so, and systems engineer at Industrial U and systems engineering major at USC, right? Right, yeah. Excellent, excellent. And so how did you sort of get involved with this Club H2O? So one of my friends um, approached me. He's, uh, I'm on the USC surf team there. And one of our founders for this club, uh, or the president right now, um, approached me and asked me to join. Mm -hmm. and. I heard about his ideas and I was very like intrigued and I was very excited to be a part of his team. Yeah, okay. And so tell us a little bit about what, what Club H2O is and what it does. Great. Uh, club H2O is like a small club at the University of Southern California where we distribute um, water filters to rural and third world countries that are facing a clean water crisis. And a lot of the times clean water is one of the biggest causes of um, waterborne diseases, obviously, and um, one of the problems that these rural co uh, communities are facing is that they don't have, they not necessarily they don't have access to clean water, is, no, or access to water is access to clean water. Right, right. Yeah, indeed. Uh, in my own work, as you, you might know, I uh, work out in the Pacific Islands, and a lot of the areas there have get uh, rely on rainwater catchment to get their uh, drinking water, and a lot of the rainwater catchment tanks, if they are not properly maintained and the roofs aren't cleaned and the gutters aren't cleaned, uh, they get contamination, organic debris builds up, uh, bacterial populations start to flourish, and pretty soon you've got really very heavily contaminated drinking water. And it's really just simply the bacterial contamination is really the huge issue in a lot of cases. It's not heavy metals, it's not pesticides, you know, not chemical additives, it's simply bacterial contamination from organic debris. Okay. And these filters knock out like 99.99% .99 of all bacteria. Right, right, right. So, something incredible. Yeah, no, they're amazing. Uh, I was looking at them, they, uh, they, they look like they're highly efficient. So, and some, one of your fellow USC students developed these? Right, um, so one of our, found, uh, one of our founders, uh, Kevin Cassell, um, he's a senior now at University of Southern California, developed these water filters. Um, Originally, how our club started was uh, we were buying water filters from a different company or manufacturer, but they're charging way, way too much, uh, $50 per water filter. Mm -hmm. but, um, and they started to increase the prices on us, and our president was like, hey, like, these water filters right. are like water filters, right? We, let's, let's try to think of an idea of, like, we can make it better and cheaper and more efficient. Mm -hmm. and, we came up with aquas filters. Yeah, yeah. They look really interesting. Just that, that little cylinder that you just saw saw on the on the screen there, uh, a few inches long, uh, inch in diameter. Uh, they must have. I, I gather those several stages of filters because you can put really mucky water in the one end, and you and yet that muck doesn't get all the way through the filter. It somehow is, is successively. They must have a set of successive coarse, medium, fine, very fine, ultra fine, super ultra fine filters in them or something like that, right? Right, right, right. So these aqueous filters contain thousands of micro filters mm -hmm. within themselves and each one, each filter that it goes through is uh, smaller and smaller like you just said and they're certified to 0 0.1 micron mm -hmm. absolute which uh, 0 0.1 is able to filter out most, actually 99.9% .9 of uh, bacteria. Mm -hmm. As well as I'm sure fungi, parasites, right, uh, all those uh, different uh, stuff. Yeah, uh, no, that, that's that's wonderful, and yeah, this problem is really widespread. I mean, there are really you know uh, millions and millions and hundreds of millions of people around the world who lack access to clean water on a daily basis, and then in emergency situations, that, that number balloons upwards when right. when people's existing water systems get overwhelmed. So this is great work that you're doing. So. Uh, how does your club sort of work on how do you how do you get these filters out how do you figure out where they're needed and, and get them there so actually that's one of the problems that we're facing with our clubs as we start to grow and expand our uh, operations but generally we get people what we call like h2o ambassadors mm -hmm. or just travelers that are going to 
these rural places, um, a lot of the times it's USC uh, mission um, clubs that go out there to work or some other local uh, nonprofits to go out to these regions and um, we, we give them water, our, our water filters and we train them on how to use them. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how we distribute them out. Oh, okay. Well, cool. We, we, we actually, following the show, should follow up on that because, you know, we have staff who go out to all the, all the U.S. affiliated Pacific Island on a pretty routine basis, and almost all those places could use these kind of filters at some time or another. So we should, we should really uh, get them more broadly distributed out there. Right, great, great, um, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so, but you, you've already taken them to Africa, to India, Nepal. Right, right. Um, um, we, we've got them to Ghana. Um, different places in Africa, a lot of rural villages in uh, northern and southern India. Mm -hmm. um, we've given them to Nepal. We've also done some places in the Pacific. And we also done, we also sent water filters to Haiti when they had, uh, when they had those uh, earthquakes mm -hmm. or natural disasters. Um, that's how we, like, we always send them to mm -hmm. places that need water, like clean water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one, one of the beauties of them, as I see it, is, is it's, it's such an appropriate technology for a lot of developing world countries. I mean, here in this picture, you see that, that muddy water in, in the bucket. And this is typical in, in bad situations. They've got, yes, they've got water, but it's, it's stuff you wouldn't want on you wouldn't dare drink, basically. And so it's much better than, say, a fancy UV sterilization system or a reverse osmosis system, which takes a lot of power, a lot of technology, a lot of know-how to maintain. These are these simple little plastic filters. You, know, you punch a hole in your bucket and hook it up there, or just screw it onto a, an existing spigot, stick the filter on the other end, and you're ready to go, right? Right, right. Uh, one of the interesting stories that I heard from one of our H2 ambassadors was actually what was our, um, their trip to India, where they actually went to a pretty, I think it was um, Delhi, I think, one of these major cities, and they were staying with the a pretty wealthy doctor there that had really modern homes, modern systems and everything. But when it came to dinner time, the, the doctor, the Indian doctor um, said, he's like, oh shoot, I forgot to boil water. And you would think that in one of these major cities, they will have clean water there, but no, they, they have to boil their water to drink. Right, the, the infrastructure and the water systems in so much of the world is, is so, uh, I mean, we sometimes think of our U.S. system as having its flaws when you think of Flint, Michigan, and things like this. But those are so rare. In the U.S., most of our water system really is pretty good. I mean, the, the, you can pretty much rely that you can turn on a tap anywhere and you can drink the water and you don't really think twice about it. Yeah, the systems may leak a little water out, you know, da da da. But, but losses in some other parts of the world are appalling. Uh, I had a, a colleague of mine who went to Pohnpei and helped. Uh, uh, redo the water system part of Koror, their, their uh, not Koror, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Colonia, the capital. And they were using, I think it was a per day basis, something like 111,000 gallons of water per day. They replaced the, the infrastructure pipes and they were then using like 10,000 gallons per day. I mean, literally they were wasting 90% of their water, it was just leaking away. Uh, and of course, if it's leaking that badly, you know stuff is leaking back in too right. from the ground. Right, right, and right. That's, so yes, you can't trust the water out of your taps, uh, and that's I'm sure true in much of India, even in what you know relatively modern, well-developed parts of the cities. Right. Um, also, with these uh, these water filters, um, they actually save a lot of energy um, because a lot of these rural places, um, in order to disinfect their water, they might put it under a fire or boil it to right. get all the bacteria out, and this. Also, you don't need that anymore with these water filters. Yeah, right, right. And, and you're, yeah, so you're saving all that, the, the energy, you're saving the natural resources, the forests can grow that, that help uh, uh, hold the ground in place, control erosion. Right. Uh, yeah, it, it's... it's and, over. And, and when they cut down these trees, they also increase deforestation, right. which also decreases the amount of rainwater that comes in. Right. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a, a really gets into a vicious cycle in a lot of these areas. I was just... Uh, reading Jared Diamond's book, Collapse. I don't know if you've, if you've had the pleasure of reading it. It's, a, it's sort of a study of a bunch of societies and why there have been these collapses. And one of the large issues is this deforestation issue that, that basically countries have over-harvested, island, particularly island nations have over-harvested their trees until they don't have any wood left, basically, and then it changes the whole water table and their whole city, right. the whole civilization is just 
implode, basically. Well, what comes to mind is Madagascar, where they, um, they burned their trees, um, and all that's left are those big bam trees. Yeah. Um, they're, they're, I'm pretty sure they're facing some kind of water crisis over there, too. So. Yeah, no, uh, ab absolutely. And um, places have changed more or less permanently that their whole landscapes in some areas. Um, there had been in uh, Iceland, used to actually have forests. And they, the early settlers who say that settled there essentially you know, chopped and burned them all down and they've never been able to regenerate. <laughs> so uh, it's, yeah, it, it, it can be a, a huge issue. And these filters, less, it's one of those nice examples of sort of systems thinking, right? You, you see one, one little thread that you tug on here and it, of the water and it begins to reverberate through the forests and to the, to the whole landscape. And, right, right, right. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, it's like in, in the bigger picture of things, um, a lot of places look towards a decentralization of water treatment, so pretty much do-it-yourself kind of uh, water treatment. And one of these, in, in systems engineering, like you think, how can I get these, uh, how can I do a decentralization water treatment? Mm -hmm. And water filters are a, a great idea because relatively small and easy to distribute. Right, and these are at a nice scale because they uh, are able to, to to run through about 380 gallons a day or something, which is great. I mean, that's more than enough for a family, enough for a small community. Um, so it could really help on, on a lot of the smaller island, uh, the little outer lying atolls and all in Yap, for instance. You have you know a few hundred people here or a few dozen people there. Uh, these small groups, and, you know, one of these filters can make a huge difference uh, to these people in terms of having access to good water or not, um, particularly if they've just been devastated by you know, a hurricane or something and their rainwater system, may, catchment system may not be up to snuff, you know. Uh, and that, that certainly happens. Uh, they just, actually they just had a, uh, a water spout hit, uh, I think it was Fice, and ran over it and knocked out a whole bunch of the buildings and the roof, tore roofs off and yeah. So uh, we should think about getting some out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely will. <laughs> yeah, of course, the problem is it's hard to get out there after they've had those disasters. But, oh, right. um, so uh, tell, let's jump back to Club H2O a little bit. How long has it been in existence? Um, it, it's been about four years since okay. it got established at uh, USC. And, and you said you're now, you've just gotten yourselves sort of formed in a formal 501c3 uh, nonprofit? Right, right. We just got our title uh, in September. So we're trying to wrap up uh, our um, fundraising and our operations. So Yeah, because that, that gives you some nice options. If once you become a formal 501c3, you can, you can really begin to do sort of more bigger scale, more official kinds of things and uh, raise some serious money for, for this so you could scale up your production and, and get uh, better distribution channels. All right. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Um, and over these past four years, about, about how many filters would you guess you've distributed? I'm sure um, you can't, can't count them all exactly, but. <laughs> I would say like anywhere between like 100, 120. Mm -hmm. um, I, these, these water filters uh, are, they can really give a community up to like 75 to 100 people so they may seem small mm -hmm. but they have a big impact yeah yeah absolutely absolutely and yeah so if you've if you've uh and how, how are you producing these at this point? I mean, is, is this one person building them by hand, or do you have teams doing this, or is it all automated now? No, um, so we it's manufactured in China, but uh -huh. we um, it gets sent to like in that um that batch that we get of these water filters, they get, one of them gets sent to a lab to get tested to actually check if it actually filters out all the pathogens that it's um, certified to filter out. Mm -hmm. So that's how we do our testing in, uh, for these water filters. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And um, so the other key thing, of course, with any of these technologies is being sure that the people who are taking it out to the field have the proper training. And one of the things I like so much about these filters is they are they come in this very simple little package and you have some very nice instructional materials with them that's very simple. It's a few clear diagrams or a step one, step two, step three, you know, and they can they can see pretty clearly. But you still have to be sure your volunteers all know what what to do, how to how to use them, right? Right, right. Um, so these instructional, you know, like a picture is like a thousand words. Mm -hmm. These instructional um, pictures are actually very easy to read. But we also are in the works of making um, instructional videos to go along with these uh, water filters for our uh, for our distributors to bring them out to the field. So 
that's one of the things that we're working towards. Excellent, excellent. And then, of course, it's useful if you have uh, somebody in the field who can translate into local language, too. So if your community members have questions, you know, I mean, we run into this all the time because of the multiple languages out in the Pacific Islands, you know, and Yap alone has something like four mutually indecipherable languages, right? Uh, and then multiple dialects of each of those languages. So uh, it's, it's oftentimes there are real, uh, real issues, but that's, as you say, that's a, it's a great reason to do the pictorial instructions, you know. I, uh, years ago, ran into some uh, an, uh, IKEA furniture that we bought, and I, I was just utterly stunned. The instructions did not have a single word on them. It was, just, it was just all diagrams. It was just a set of diagrams. And you just look at these diagrams like, oh, this has got to go here. These have got to go here. Right, right. Put them, and suddenly you've got this piece together without a word being spoken, basically, <laughs> read in this case. So yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's great, a great way to do it. Um, so what are your, what are your, uh, sort of your plans? Where, where, you know, where is Club H2O going? Um, so right now, ever, ever since we got our 501c, uh, Nonprofit title. We're trying to reach out to uh, businesses in the LA region uh, to help sponsor and get get raise more money in order to uh, get these water filters. Uh, one of the plans that we have is actually contacting more nonprofit because we got our 501c um, nonprofit title. It kind of legitimizes us, mm -hmm. and we're trying to contact more local nonprofits. Uh, Red, Claw, Red Cross and, um, you know, Prow, which mm -hmm. you're a part of, um, just all different uh, dif different um, nonprofits that go to these rural communities mm -hmm. um, to send these water filters because um, one, one of the great things about our water filters, or at least Club H2O, is that we don't have any uh, travel expenses and especially if you're going to these uh, rural communities, it, it could cost anywhere for 1000 2000 for oh, a yeah, ticket. Yeah. I, I, I hear you on that. We, we, we do all of our work out in the islands. I know the travel is time-consuming and expensive. Hey, we're going to uh, have to take a little break here. Uh, so uh, we're talking with Mr. Terry Lamb of Club H2O from USC. They distribute these water filters all around the world to places that need them. Um, I'm your host, Ethan Allen, here on Likeable Science, and we'll be right back after a short break. Aloha, Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green Think Tech Hawaii. I appear every other Monday at three in the afternoon. Do not tune in in the morning. My topic is energy efficiency. It sounds dry as heck, but it's not. We're paying $5 billion a year for imported oil. My job is to shave that, shave that, shave that down in homes and buildings while delivering better comfort, better light, better air conditioning better everything. So if you're interested in your future, you'd better tune in to me. Three o'clock every other Monday, code green, aloha, and thank you very much. And you're back here on Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. Here on Likeable Science today in the Think Tech Studios with me is Terry Lamb from USC. And Terry is a, uh, one of the board members of Club H2O there at USC that distributes these aqueous water filters all around the world to places that, uh, that need clean water, and which are many and growing. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's talk a little bit about the, the filter itself and, and sort of, so I assume this the guy who developed them, who was, a, you said, a, a, a student there, was working in some nanotech lab or something? Was this, was he a, I mean, he was an engineering student of some sort, I assume. No, he was a business student, but really? we, he worked with uh, engineers in ah. order to design these water filters. Um, it's, it, it's a pretty simple design. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, like you said, like thousands of micro filters within, mm -hmm. uh, within inside that go smaller and smaller and filters out more bacteria mm -hmm. so. so and it's basically just sort of it, it's really fibers as i understand it just sort of randomly packed in but depending on how thick you make the fibers and how tight you pack them you can keep sort of setting different porosities as it were right right and uh, one of the great things about it is that um, some of the pathogens get stuck uh, it doesn't filter through right? right and obviously over time as you keep using it it starts to flow out uh, slower, right? right? And you can use one, um, you can back flush it, and 
it makes a great thing for uh, durability. Yeah, you, you've got these beautiful, again, very simple instructions about take, get one cup of clean water out and then you, you back flush it and do that three times and then forward and back flush it a couple more times. And it makes sense if you set up a very coarse filter and finer and finer, if you back flush it, you're gonna knock all the, the coarse stuff back off. Uh, and yeah, it's, that's a great thing. The, the, these filters have a life of three to five years that you're estimating in the, in the field? Right, right, we're estimating we're anywhere between three years if you don't maintain it, but mm -hmm. it's a mechanical filtration system, mm -hmm. so it can last quite a bit as long as you take care of it. So mm -hmm. um, depending on how they take care of it or um, how well they maintain it, it's gonna increase their longevity. Yeah, and that, that, you know, that gets really to a really critical point out, again, the education of, of the, the end user and having them understand right from the start, it's, it's not enough just to get this thing and start using it, you've got to maintain it. And the maintenance is really simple, I mean, relative to something like a reverse osmosis system, which is big and complex and has electrical components and switches and filters and has to be really uh, paid a lot of attention to. And, and have a, it takes a certain level of technological skill to maintain that. This is really very simple. Yes, every once it starts slowing down, you do this simple little five minute operation to back flush it a few times and then put it back in place, run through a cup again, and you're back in business. Right, it's very simple to maintain. Mm -hmm. um, I was watching one of your shows, uh, Professor Smith from uh, University of Virginia mm -hmm. came on here and was talking about uh, these purification pots, which are which um, purify water mm -hmm. through um, in incorporating uh, silver ions in right. it. Um, and usually that is a pretty good way to filter, but it takes a lot of skill to make, um, and it's very easy to break mm -hmm. uh, compared to something like a water filter, where, or at least our aquas filter is just very small, mm -hmm. very simple to maintain. It lasts a long time. Mm -hmm. it, it pretty much takes no education or very advanced knowledge mm -hmm. of um, something like you said, like reverse osmosis, which right. you need like a specialist to be there. Um, very simple. Yeah, and I mean we we see that all too often in these uh, in the islands where I work is people meaning so well bring a technology out there that, that's simply not appropriate. So in Palau, I was out there recently, and they have this uh, a great array of solar panels by one of their government buildings and. Uh, all neatly set up to cover a whole parking area so you've got your cars are all in the shade and big solar panels all over. And some component of that solar system broke a few months after installing it. And that sat there for a year as just providing shade and no solar power because they couldn't get the part and they didn't, didn't have the technological expertise on hand to fix it. It's like <laughs> a year of solar power wasted because right. you know, of some, whereas yeah, something like this, I mean, it doesn't take yeah, well, if your end user has any sense at all about it, has seen that done once or twice, it's like, oh, okay, I see how to do this. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. It's very simple. Yeah. I mean, ac actually, the Maddie drops, to what you, what you referred to, that James Smith at PVA did, are, are again, a, a, I mean, they are an incredibly simple thing. They, they took some very high level technological expertise to develop those, just as indeed developing the, the, the right kinds of fibers packing the right way for yours did, but there again, once, I mean, it, end user just drops one in a bucket of water and that's, that's, you know, that's about the level of skill it takes to use it. Right, yeah, that's, that's one of <laughs> right. the engineering designs right. for these things, yeah. um, especially it's very hard at, like, especially in these rural uh, places where you have to make it inexpensive, very simple to make yeah. and maintain, mm -hmm. um, it has to be culturally acceptable, right, right? Um, and it has to be transportable. Right, so. yeah. And, and the, the, the whole issue of culturally acceptable is, is really, a really odd one we, we face in, uh, in my work in Yap, where on the main island uh, of Yap, there are about 85-95% uh, of the population actually has access in their homes to clean chlorinated water from one of three systems on Yap. It has three main water filtration distribution systems, all of which really do a good job of keeping good quality drinking water. But because of the traditions where the people say, well, you know, my grandparents drank the rainwater and they were fine. My parents drank the rainwater and they were fine. And I drank rainwater growing up and I'm fine. You know, so I still want to drink it even though now, you know, this rainwater may not be as good as it used to be because if the system hasn't been maintained or the roofs aren't clean anymore or whatever. And they don't like the taste of the chlorine in the water. Uh, right. And that they even uh, are sort of bringing up a new generation to sort of follow that same tradition, although it, it, it's a shame because, I mean, they do have 
rates uh, of gastrointestinal illnesses uh, from the from drinking water they shouldn't be drinking. You know. <laughs> right, right. And um, these water filters provide like a easy easy way to yeah. um, get clean water, right. and that doesn't taste any different from. Uh, yeah. And at the same time, you know, they're they're a really nice device, uh, like those Maddie drops, to to do science education, uh, sort of dissect one of these filters. How does this thing work? Why does it work? You could really start talking to kids about, you know, what, what's in your water. Get a microscope. Again, a simple little one of those simple fold scopes costs fifty cents, you know, and uh, see what's in your water, and and then look at one of the filters and, and understand why this progressive filtering actually how that really works and why it, it's so effective at, at keeping things out. And, and there's a, very powerful educational tool there, I think. Right, right. So, so and that I guess, I guess brings us to a point. So, you're you're in school. You're you're going into this whole industrial and systems engineering. And what, what's your advice to to uh, students who might be thinking about this kind of, of work and education and career? I would just say find something you're passionate about and mm -hmm. just pursue it. Just gotta go and just don't don't seize a hey, uh, don't. Be lazy and just seize the moment, I guess. Mm -hmm. Whatever chance you get, you just got to go for it. And somehow you might not know where it's going to lead you, but as long you won't know unless you try. So if you want to do something as like nonprofit kind of work or you want to be doing something, anything, you just got to just go and do it and just try. And if you fail, then you learn something from it, right? right. And you can keep, keep doing it until you succeed. Yeah, exactly. That, that's one of the big take-home messages of life, right? Is that failure isn't permanent unless you let it. Sort of, uh, you know, you you got to just, hey, it's just it. I didn't do it right this time, so let's 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 look at that again and try something a little different and see what, what uh, we don't batter our head against the wall, but we, we keep going at things from different angles and, and become a, a better problem solver over time, right? Right. Um, it, it sounds very cliche, but it is very true. Um, a lot of the times that like a lot of different projects may not end up where you think it, it would end up like i i can say like i've contacted like a lot of different businesses for club issue thinking like hey this is a great idea like please support us sometimes it just never works and but you won't know unless you try yeah i mean i would never have guessed when i uh, was doing my graduate work studying fish color vision that i'd end up out in the pacific island dealing with water issues you know that seems like an odd one so we don't know where life is going to take us but uh I, li I like your idea to find, find something that you care about and, and go for it and uh, pursue it with, your, with all the passion at your, at your uh, uh, available to you. Uh, anyhow, so uh, Mr. Terry Lamb from USC Club H2O doing amazing work around the globe. Uh, congratulations to you and I, I wish you the very best in that. Uh, I'm your host, Ethan Allen. I hope you'll come back uh, and join us next week, uh, next Friday, for another episode of Likeable Science. Bye-bye.